My name is Dan Primack, uh, business editor of Axios and, and writer of the ProRata email. So I have Aiden Senkit here um, from Felicis Ventures. So Aiden, okay, so you probably don't remember this because I guess it probably meant more to me than to you. Um, but so the first time I met you was in San Francisco. We were on a panel, a, or I was moderating a panel of so-called super angels. And it was you and Chris Saka and Mike Maples and a couple others. Yes. And two things. One, I had never heard of any of you. And neither clearly of the audience because there was about 15 people who showed up. Um, yes. No one cared. So talk, can you give me a little bit of evolution? You, you were one of that group like 10 years ago who was investing relatively little money but doing seed deals, you know, more than the typical angel, but was Absolutely. doing seed deals. Explain a little the evolution from that to what Felicis is now, which is this kind of multi-stage, much larger with other partners, you know, yeah. kind of quasi-traditional venture capital firm. Yeah, I mean, look, it's uh, an amazing ride. Um, I was very lucky. I tell people, like, my story, like, I'm Turkish, just like Jamaican bobsled, like, and I've never had any connections to VC. All the VCs I talked to after Google thought I wouldn't make a VC. So I'm like, well, like, that's great fuel. I'm going to take... Uh, that belief that something can't be done and turn it into positive energy that it could be done with a different way of thinking by being an outsider. Um, and I think we were just really lucky to be part of that era. Uh, it was an interesting era where a lot of companies uh, for the first time could be formed with very little capital, but venture capital at that point was set up in a way uh, in a previous era where you had to buy your own servers, you had to buy, like everything was very expensive to set up, but in that era, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was changing very fast and you could get companies up really, really fast with a lot of uh, services and we were really lucky. YC was just starting. Uh, there were m much fewer companies. Uh, the angel like family, angel investors were maybe like 50. That is so different today. And one of the things that we did in terms of evolution, a couple of years of that, we were just really lucky to be part of that wave and it created momentum. And I realized that things were going really well. You know, we had, uh, I had 12 exits or so. I'm like, I really want to build a real franchise. Like, Why, I, I Why not take just stay doing that? If that's working well, you're getting to put small checks in at the very, very beginning. Why not just stick with that? Because by the way, there doesn't seem to be a new class of those people right now. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, look, it's personal perspective. Like everybody has a founder journey and my founder journey is I don't dabble in things. Like I really was serious and I had a lot of colleagues that you know made a lot of money. It's the way of the Silicon Valley. You angel invest in companies, you advise them. And to me, like this was my startup. I was gonna take it all the way. Uh, I wanted to build a franchise from start. I wanted to build a brand new team. I wanted to surround myself with really smart people where people are like, these people won't make a great VC. And as a result, we have one of the most diverse VC firms. Um, we have one of the most diverse founder communities. Um, and it's been an amazing ride. I also wanted to get the validation, to be honest with you. So a lot of VC is like, you're in this privileged position. I don't know, people really appreciate it. Like, you get to work with these amazing founders and you know, where the money comes from, the limited partner angle is not very much talked about. But I just wanted to go through the same journey that the first people that started Sequoia, Benchmark, or others, like, I wanted those institutions to back us and say, you know what, we see something in you. Um, and, you know, like, it took about 50 no's before we got our first yes, but we did Who eventually get Who was your first get. yes? Um, the first yes was uh, Judith from WeatherGage. Mm. And it was, by the way, a third level hand-me-down. So an LP said no, said, you know, like the same thing. Oh, like we can't really do it, but like talk to this person. That person said, we can't really do it. Talk to this other person. And then I think Judith was like a third one. And she's like, we'll do it. So, you know, you, you've mentioned kind of wanting to, to go through the process of what the founders go through. So, so founder friendly has been a term for years now in the Valley. And you guys probably embody it more than most. So let me, let me ask you about yeah. two pieces of that. One, I guess in 2014, so like five yeah. years ago mm -hmm. now, you guys said very publicly that Felicis would not, in your words, vote, if you were on a board, I guess, and you had a vote, you would not vote against a founder. Explain that to me, because yeah. founders sometimes do things they shouldn't do. Yes. Should, aren't you supposed to, in part, be a, a bulwark against that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think we're still having this discussion, and one of the reasons we also wanted to start a VC firm and franchise, uh, in addition to being founder-friendly, and I know, like, Mark has this amazing block, both sides of the table, we believe in being on the same side of the table, and uh, one of our, you know, great founders, Toby from Shopify, he has this term that he calls trust battery, so I think one of the reasons we wanted to start this franchise, we want to do many things differently, you know, just to kind of conclude the previous point, like we invested in companies outside of Silicon Valley and US, work really well. We invested in frontier areas when it was not popular, work really well. This whole founder friendly thing, I think, look, 
one of the most important things that I learned about venture is not about the 10 things that can go right. And I know you're going to probably ask me like some other questions about companies where, is this really going to work? This is scary. This is sketchy. The thing is, venture is all about things that can go wildly right. Most people only focus on the risk factors, but they don't focus on, well, what if, if things really go wildly right? And that's when we have these great success stories. So one of the things we realized is, look, the, the one thing that was missing in venture, it was dark side and the other side. And I'm like, no, we want to be on the same side. And we very soon realized, and by the way, we've done like every year we do an extensive survey with the founders. We ask them a lot of things. And the number one thing consistently that every founder says, the only thing we care about in our investors is that we can trust them, that they believe in the same dream, and they have conviction in what we do. That's the number one thing that they care about. So we realized that we needed to build our reputation, and we wanted to be the first, ideally only VC, whose brand was predicated on having an Im immense trust with the founders and being on the same side. And we, want, we, we said, look, like if we say things, it doesn't mean anything. We have to actually concretely do something. So we do have a legal document that says we're going to vote our shares with the founders. The board thing is different. That's fiduciary. Like That is a little bit different. But that establishes great trust because founders are, look, these people are committing. Um, we also did a 1% pledge where, like again, in the last two years. Well, let's get to that in a second. Let me yeah. just go back. OK, yeah. so, so I, I'm at a venture back startup, yeah. right? And obviously, so I, I'm rowing in the same direction. Theory is my CEO. Yeah. But if he does something, or, or, or we're having, let me rephrase, if we're having a conversation about what should be done next, if I think it's a terrible idea, I'm obviously going to voice that. I mean, do you, do you voice that big disagreement? And simply, if the disagreement persists at the end, you just go along with what the founder said? Because you, you, know, you, you made the comment about you know, they want us to have the same vision. Yep. Vision is an ultimate goal in where you're going. The, the method to which you get yep. there might be different. Let me put it this way. I, I, look, I think the most important thing, and this is contrarian, it's a little bit contrarian, I think the only way to have frank, healthy debates with founders is when you have a battery of trust. So I think the main thing that we found is like, I don't know how many of you have experienced this as a founder or as an investor. You go into the board meetings, it's very structured, and it's set up. The founders are under immense pressure to show things that are up and to the right. Investors are always looking for, hey, what, what, what are the founders not telling me? So. The, the, I think what people misunderstand, the fact that we said we vote our shares with the founders doesn't mean that we don't have debate, doesn't mean that we don't have criticism, doesn't mean that we tell them that we might disagree. What we're saying is that the final word is theirs. Honestly, when we do that, I think, you know, and especially when we're not on their board, um, they actually appreciate what we say a lot more then when we have a formal position and they're like, well, in this formal position, are they saying that because they might replace our job? So we have a much more frank and healthy debate. Let me ask one other question about this. And this has obviously come up a lot with Facebook, particularly in the last 48 hours. When, when you're investing in a company, what's your thoughts on founder, con not really kind of indefinite founder control and voting rights? I mean, is, it go is going with this, are you comfortable with the founder knowing that you can theoretically, you, when I say you, you as an investor class can never fire them outside of some sort of massive fraud? So let me make one thing clear. So I think the party that has the ability to fire the founder is the board. If the board is majority, they can fire the founder. Uh, when we vote our shares, that's kind of like the, sh the shares we hold, and there is majority. So it's a little bit more complicated. Look, the reality is when you look at a lot of the successful companies, um, a, a lot of them, the founders have control. I mean, Ryan from Qualtrics talked about it. I mean, we keep talking about these like outlier scenarios, and I'm not saying like, hey, the founder is good or bad. Like, I'm not passing judgment. But we basically like for 10 years when Facebook was growing, there's a lot of great things, and then other stuff happens, and all of a sudden like. Facebook is evil, or like Google is growing, like has great services, provides a lot of stuff, and then something happens like Google is evil. Like, look, you know, we're always going to have these takes on companies and founders. Like, you know, sometimes they can't. Not do necessarily that it's evil, but there's yeah. no check on the founders. Like, and Facebook's a good example. There's no check on Mark. No matter what he does, there's really no check. I mean, in theory, you could say everybody stops using it or advertisers yeah. run away. But from a structural perspective, from a board perspective, there's no check on him. Look, I, I think like I want to. I mean, look, we can, we can argue that. And there could be things where companies can get really big. And you know, at the stage, like we are so far away from that stage where companies are so powerful. I mean, we're investing in companies when they have 10, 20, 50 people. Fair. So, and, so and so the thing that I want to say is, look, 
we, we've, we've done about 300 investments. We went back, like how many times in our history has there been a situation where there has been a really questionable founder and maybe something like bad or like we suspect that something bad happening, that was like maybe one. Um, so what we said is look, just because like in, in humanity there's always gonna be bad behavior. Like we cannot like turn that off. Even if you have checks and balances, people will find a way to get around it. So what we said is look, we're building this firm on a positive like conviction. So like just because that there could be a few bad apples or a few edge case scenarios, it's not gonna take us away from backing these amazing companies who are completely aligned with the founders. The other, the other thing, you, and, and you started bringing it up. So you guys have, have pledged what, for whatever check you give 1% not on basically the top. So 1% yeah. of your checks, non-dilutive capital to the found to the companies for the founders for either for, for counseling or team or, or for coaching, yep. really to help them. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about that. And then the corollary to that is why not a similar check for the company employees? Um, well, I mean, I wish we could do more. Uh, we're starting here. Uh, it's a starting point. I'm not saying it's the only thing we'll do. So w we were very, very curious. We did about 24 months of research, we talked to about two dozen founders. And w when w whenever we have a conversation with them, by the way, this is the reason why it's so important to earn their trust. Every conversation with a founder starts like this. We sit down, how are things going? Things are amazing, we're killing it, everything is up into the ride. And a lot of times, maybe one drink or 10 drinks later, like the founder is like, well, yes. And there are some things that we're really stressed about. And you know, here's the thing. You might want to be concerned if the founder's gotten 10 drinks in. Exactly. Just saying, they might yeah. have some issues anyway, going on. Yeah, I tend to dramatize things a little bit. Um, so the whole point here is after like, we get to the frank part of the discussion, um, what we have found is that you know, in our venture uh, ecosystem, when we look at the successful companies, they are not normal companies. They're going through external ordinary growth and it's taking a huge toll on the founders, the competition, the scaling, having to hire these people, sometimes having to let these people go. And what we found is that their number one problem, honestly, is not the service bureau. It's not like editorial review. Their number one problem is mental stress. I mean, probably a lot of, almost everybody in the world is dealing with mental stress. But the kind of founders we deal with like 10 times more so. And so what we realize is like at the end of the day, we ask them what is the one thing that we could do for you that nobody else is doing or nobody else cares about? And it turns out it's like just mental stress. They're like, you know, we don't, we feel guilty spending money on coaching. And by the way, like it's super helpful when you look at and or talk to a lot of the successful CEOs or founders, one of the things that changes their trajectory is to work with an amazing coach. Um, and this is a learned skill. Like you, you look at sports, I think at the end of today there was a great session. Um, even the most successful people need help in terms of like, hey, how do I motivate my people, hire them? So short, long story short, uh, and we're doing it out of our management fees. You know, we started with this one person pledge, uh, percent pledge, and you know, we're really excited how many about it. Startups are taking advantage of it. Uh, there's definitely a handful of them, and we hope that number grows over time. Uh, you know, right before we got on stage, uh, Jackie was talking about uh, the, the prospect of economic downturns or recession, whether it be in the credit market or, or in general, and, and she made a comment that, you know, time is not the predictor. What is your sense right now, and I'm not asking macro, but what do you think, are your founders concerned, do you feel, about the kind of macro issues that, that could be coming down the pike for them? Are they getting one of these RIP good times slide decks from you? Yeah, I mean, look, it's kind of funny. I was just thinking about it. I don't know. Um, so I, I grew up in Turkey and I grew up, when I was a kid, we had 100% inflation. Every night, like my family is like, oh my God, if we don't make the right investment, our network is gonna go down by 50%. So I'm just thinking like downturn, like downturn, like so we're gonna go down 10%. I spend like half of my life worrying that we're gonna lose everything we have at the end of the year, or it's gonna go at least down by half. So everything we do is always being prepared. Like we can't control the downturn, we can't control the intensity of it, but we can be really well prepared for it. So as a result, one of the things that I'm realizing is that very few, like some founders think about it more than others, but one of the things we can do, and it's, it's important to establish trust with the founders so they actually value our advice and take our advice is we are the most conservative investor often in their syndicate and I tell them, look, the best way to not have to worry about downturn is to have a lot of cushion to a lot of buffer. So the only reason downturn would, downturn would hurt you is your revenues uh, have concentration, so you have dependency. If one sector were to go away, you would take a hit. And if you have to raise money, if you don't have to raise money for a couple years, why would you get stressed about it? Because you can weather that downturn. 
Um, so I think that we, what we always advise founders, have twice as, mon as much money that you need, uh, have twice as much runway that you need. If you're prepared and like, you know, you are set up, so then you don't have to worry about it. Go back to business and like keep growing the company. And so like our influence is just be more conservative than usual. Are, are there areas, are, uh, is this working? I think so. Are there areas that, of investing that if, if you and I were having this conversation a year ago, you were interested in and today you, if not wouldn't touch, at least are much less interested in? You know, so that's the other thing. One of the other things that we did from the very get-go, uh, we have a very high number of very interesting and uncorrelated companies that have done really well. And the number one factor that we try to pay attention to is critical nature. Like, Things like home sales, curing cancer, payments, um, there are certain like areas that are just never gonna go away out of, fa out of fashion. So I'm like, look, these are really important areas. If we actually find great companies in these areas, no matter what the downturn, these are the companies that are least likely to get affected. The one interesting thing that did happen in our portfolio that is worth mentioning, and we talked about it backstage a little bit, I'm an ex-Google guy, so when I first started, 90% of what we did was consumer. Today, it's probably less than 5% for the last few years, but health, uh, it came out of nowhere in the last two, three years. Go back. Why the 30%. consumer? Like, I understand having interest in other things and going into other frontier technologies. Huh? Why the declining interest in consumer? Um, I feel that it's very difficult to have meaningful companies in consumer, at least on internet. Maybe if you look at consumer, there is CPG, there is finance part of consumer, but when it comes to consumer internet, um, the big companies that we have, they kind of took scale uh, and, and market to such a level that it is very, very difficult uh, to find winners. And we feel like it's just not, you know, our fund is not set up to find those winners and back them. If you do have a few of them, kind of like Snap or others, you get into these 100, 200, 300 million dollar rounds. I don't know, maybe you consider scooters in that category. We don't have any scooter bets. You know, we don't have any of these other bets. You know, I think one of the things that helped us is understanding what our comfort and competence zone is and not to get outside of the comfort or competence zone. It's interesting, but like when I look at the, the big exits that you guys have had, you have a couple of big consumer companies in there. You know, Dollar Shave is in there. I don't know if you consider Fitbit to be a consumer company, but I assume you would. Um, you know that it, I know it, they consider themselves to be a health company, but they're sold at Best we Buy. Call, they're a we, consumer company. Uh, we consider, like Fitbit, we consider it to be a frontier company. Uh, I mean, maybe you can cons cons consider it consumer because consumers are buying it, but when I think of consumer, I'm thinking more like, I don't know, Google, Facebook, or whatever. Dollar Shave Club certainly was consumer. Uh, I think it was an exception. I'm really proud that we have that LA company. But when you look at you know, some of our bigger successes like Adyen and Shopify, these are hardcore enterprise companies. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've All shifted right. away. Okay, so this is your list of companies that you guys have exited for a at a value of a billion or more, not all the money going for lease. So I'm just gonna go through this quick. Yeah. There's a bunch of them. Uh, Merikai, Climate Corp, Twitch, Shopify, Fitbit, Cruise, Dollar Shave, Rovio, Pluralsight, and Adyen. So that's 10, I think, that's 10 companies. So three questions. The first one, of each of those, which one are you most surprised became a very successful company? When you think back to your original investment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of them are... are so no, I'm asking for one, not some, just yeah. one of them. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, like, look, I, I think the one uh, that probably uh, surprises the mo surprised me the most was Cruise the self-driving car company, is because I had two demos. One was after Twitch was acquired for a billion by Amazon, because the founders of Cruise were ex-Twitch, and they're like, we party till 4 a.m., like, we're gonna go on this ride, we're just installing this new software in the car, you're gonna love it, and we got on the highway, and I think there were 50 times within 30 minutes that we were about to die. The, the system didn't work, I called my wife after the fact, I'm like, grateful to be alive. Oh my God, like, this is the worst investment of my life, you know, like, this is terrible. Um, and they're still like trying to fix the software as the car is like barely trying to stay on the lane and like the CEO is trying to keep the car on the lane. And like three months, six months later, he's like, I didn't like, we feel terrible. Like we just need to go out for another demo. All of a sudden we start and like the, the voice is like a British accent and the car is driving perfectly. I'm like, what happened? Like, did you guys really fix all of these things? He's like, yeah, it's software. Like we just worked on it like nonstop. So I think that was the one where I'm like, nobody like estimated because they didn't come out of Google. They didn't come out of one of these established things. They just hacked it and it was just 
just wonderful to see that happen. So I'm really proud of that. All right, one other question about this 10. And, and as you said, so, you know, Twitch is owned by Amazon. So a lot of these are no longer independent companies. Yes. But in theory, if you could today buy, in, buy shares in any one of these companies as themselves, which one would you buy into? What's the one you think that has the most future growth prospects? I think the one that I'm most excited about is Adyen, by the way. Um, this is like the funny Which I assume story. you still have a stake in. I, we still have a stake in. It's, it's just like one of the biggest areas. Like I'm like, how big can this thing possibly get? For those who don't know, what is Adyen? Uh, Adyen is a payments company out of Amsterdam, and I think it's the funniest story because everybody thinks that I invested in my own self because this kind of sounds like a misspelling of my name. And I have huge respect for Ryan at Qualtrics. I know that eight billion is a big exit. Uh, I think Adyen went public at 14 billion and it hit 25 billion. It's an Amsterdam company, bunch of Dutch folks. Most people still don't know about them. And I think first time they heard was when they closed eBay. Um, but look, I, I just think that this whole thing, payments is what powers commerce. Commerce is one of the largest uh, you know, uh, p components of GDP in the world. So how can you not be bullish on it? And this is like one of those companies that somehow managed to create the full stack similar to Visa or MasterCard. So when I think of like, what is the one company we have where if things were to keep going right, like there is almost like unlimited potential for upside is probably that one. And you mentioned to me backstage that, that the investments in Adyen, all the venture investments, you know, it's now IPO'd, but all the venture investments were done as common stock. There wasn't a, there wasn't a preference stack. And, and part of the way you explained that was just, you know, when you get an outlier company, particularly when you get an outlier, from your perspective, an outlier entrepreneur, can you speak to that a little bit, kind of the, the personal piece of VC? Because it seems that in some cases that's gotten lost, either via pattern matching, you've literally got some quantitative yeah. venture capital now. Yeah. I mean, does that, do you, see a mar do you see that as a legitimate way to invest, to basically use an algorithm to invest? Your former, you know, I mean, Wes used to work at Google Ventures. Yeah. They've got their machine. Hey, Wes. I mean, that's yeah. what they do. Yeah, I mean, look, I think if you, ha if you were to ask me, the one thing that I learned about venture capital that surprised me, that uh, everybody underestimated, everybody thinks venture capital is finance, so it's all about numbers and data cranking. And look, the biggest thing that I learned is all about people. Um, you can do all the data cranking you want. First of all, you would get the wrong signal. So like people would look at my idea and investment, great. You need to invest in companies where it's the misspelling of your name. It needs to be in a crazy place, like out of our Amsterdam, like totally non obvious, you know. Oh, Aiden was wearing a blue shirt. Wear a blue shirt when making investments. I'm like, look, you can look at the pattern. The pattern is telling you the truth, but it has nothing to do with if it's gonna tell you the truth, if this is a great company or not. So, I mean, the thing that I realize is like, Adyen is a good example. Look, the CEO is a cancer survivor. I think he climbed Everest. You wouldn't know any of these things. Like, it took me three years to break the ice with him to even find that out about him. Um, he just has such amazing grit. Once you find out about his story and the team story, there's no way you cannot back that company. It's just an amazing like, story. So I think the thing that I now understand about venture capital that is really special, you need to read people, understand people, and relate to them incredibly well. That is probably the most important success factors, contrary to like, all the data. And that's why we're like, look, if we basically do a really good job of understanding and relating to these founders, that's going to be the most important success factor for us. So yeah, so, so far, that has been going really well. By the way, every venture capitalist wears a blue shirt when they make their investments. So that's kind of uh, on both good deals and bad deals. That's, that's what they wear. Maybe that is not a strong signal. Yeah. And I am wearing At least male venture capitalists. So final question for you. We, talk, we, we started this by talking a little bit about the evolution of Felicis, kind of from this you know, super angel to a kind of a traditional venture capital firm. Can you talk to me a bit where you want the firm to be in five years? You know, you talked about the early days of a Sequoia, yeah. the early days of a benchmark, and they both went very different ways in terms yes, of what they, they built. Yeah. What do you want Felicis to become? Do you want it to be like this in terms of size and focus indefinitely, or is there a, a third act? Yeah, I mean, look, we have a couple important core values. Number one, when I started, uh, I, wanted, I wanted this firm to be unconventional. So the, like the, the, the one thing that I don't ever, I want us to never ever do is copy and paste. So we have to be original at all costs. Obviously, we need to have a great track record. Uh, the number one core value we have is learning and adapting rapidly. My biggest fear, life fear, is stagnation. And I'm like, look, the only thing I care about is learning and growing and doing different things, running experiments, uh, changing things, and being original. Um, and then the, the last thing, and this founder angle comes in, 
We want to be successful with empathy. So when I was like going and talking around to venture firms, there were all these like established venture capitalists. They were very successful. But the one sense that I never got was like the, a true sense of empathy. Uh, and the reason why I care about it is like my mom has been in HR for 45 years. Um, she was, you know, talent and sourcing. And the one thing I got from her, understanding people, empathy is really important. So one of the experiments that we're still running is there are a lot of venture firms that have been really successful. Like, can you name any of them known for their empathy? I don't know. And like the experiment we want to run, can you be you know, that successful or nearly that successful but with empathy? So hopefully that experiment will continue running positive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.